They join us today from Burma, Liberia, and Brazil. And we are looking forward to learning more about their work and hearing how we in the international community can better support them and learn from them. When I served as the US ambassador for global women's issues, the awards were always an annual highlight for us to raise awareness about women on the front lines, making extraordinary efforts to create a better world. It was wonderful to get to know them and I've stayed in close contact with many of them over the years. And I'm eager as I know you are to hear from today's awardees because they will take their place, not just with those who came before them, but with countless more whose names we may never know, but who are also profiles in courage, making such an incredible difference around the globe. I'm so pleased now to turn to a true champion for gender equality in her own right. Kat Fotovat is the senior official in the Office of Global Women's Issues uh, at the State Department. And that office reports directly to the Secretary of State. She has over two decades of experience advocating for human rights in conflict and post-conflict states. As the senior official on global women's issues, she leads a team of experts promoting gender equality, including women, peace and security, women's economic empowerment, combating gender-based violence, and so much more. And she works tirelessly and effectively. And we are so pleased at our institute to be able to work with Kat and her team. And she now has a special message for all of us. Kat. Good morning. My name is Kat Fotovat, and I am the senior official for the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues at the U.S. Department of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, especially Ambassador Revere, the mother of our office, for hosting this important event. It is such a pleasure to join you this morning, and I am honored to introduce you to three of our 2022 International Women of Courage awardees. Simone Sibilio de Nacimento of Brazil, Ethan Zamong of Burma, Fatia Borieno Harris of Liberia. Gender equity and equality is a long-standing cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy. We recognize that without the full and meaningful participation of women and girls, our communities, countries, and the globe are less safe, less prosperous, and more insecure. Rooted in this long-standing belief, my office is tasked with an important mandate, ensuring that the rights and empowerment of women and girls in all their diversity are integrated throughout U.S. foreign policy. One of the greatest honors of my office is our annual supporter for the Secretary of State's IWAC Awards. IWAC is just one of the many efforts the United States has undertaken to recognize and celebrate the achievements and contributions of women from around the world. IWAC shines a spotlight on women and girls who have demonstrated exceptional courage, strength, and leadership in advocating for peace, justice, human rights, gender equity and equality, and the empowerment of women and girls in all their diversity often at great personal risk and unimaginable sacrifice. Since 2007, we have supported U.S. Secretaries of State in honoring more than 170 remarkable women, including Simone, Ethan Zemong, and Fasia, representing over 80 countries as international women of courage. Simone, Ethan Zemong, and Fasia, like all of the 2022 IWAC awardees, exemplify characteristics of true women of courage and it is always so inspiring to hear directly from them. Their stories empower us to continue pushing gender equity and equality forward. And it is because of them and all the women and girls around the world that we remain deeply dedicated to advancing the status of women. Today, the world is facing several significant challenges that disproportionately impact women and girls. These include the climate crisis, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and humanitarian emergencies and conflicts in places like Ukraine, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and Yemen, just to name a few. The United States recognizes that in order to adequately address these pressing challenges, we must center the needs of women and girls in the development and implementation of policy, 
and ensure they are empowered participants in all sectors of life. One of the central focuses of our gender policy is women, peace, and security. Because as Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield has said, women make the world more peaceful. That is not just anecdotal, it is a fact. The United States is committed to advancing women's social, political, and economic empowerment to prevent the inequality that can sow instability and conflict in the first place. In 2017, the United States codified its commitment to women's safety and participation in peace and security and the WPS Act and the corresponding national strategy. The United States strategy on women, peace and security seeks to close the gender gap in leadership by mobilizing US diplomacy and programs, engaging partners, investing in women's safety and rights, and amplifying the voices of women leaders and organizations. In June 2021, the White House released the first report tracking progress on the U.S. strategy on WPS. The report highlights government-wide accomplishments, identifies gaps in our efforts, and outlines opportunities to address those gaps. The safety and meaningful participation of women in all decision-making processes related to conflict, crisis, and security leads to better and more sustainable outcomes, not only for women, but for entire communities and countries. Additionally, our WPS efforts focus on preventing and responding to gender-based violence globally through foreign assistance and diplomatic action, including in areas affected by conflict and instability. From humanitarian assistance to conflict prevention and countering violent extremism efforts, advancing women and girls' safety and human rights is imperative. Again, as Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield also said, the violence is meant to silence and we cannot allow that to happen. We must address it head on. We must ensure that their voices continue to be heard. To close, I wanna thank Simone, Ethan Zimon, and Fasia, and each of the 2022 International Women of Courage for their bravery, fearlessness, and steadfast commitment to a future worth fighting for. The United States is so proud to be your partner, and we look forward to watching the ever-growing positive impact you and your work has on your communities, countries, and the world. I also want to again thank the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security and my dear friend, Ambassador Revere, for your continued support of the IWAC Awards, your dedication to ensuring that women are safe and empowered participants in peace building and security efforts. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much uh, to Kat uh, the hard work of the, the, uh, the of we the have Burmese on the English. Can, can Burmese interpreter switch back to Burmese, please? Please go ahead, Ambassador. Now we will flash back to the award ceremony that recently took place for the introduction of our first participant from Burma. We turn to Derek Chalet, the State Department counselor. He will introduce Ethan Zamong, the Deputy Minister for Women, Youth, and Children's Affairs in the Opposition National Unity Government. And now to the video. On behalf of the U.S. Department of State, I want to congratulate E. Thin Zamong on being named one of the Secretary of State's 2022 International Women of Courage. E. Thin Zamong is an inspiring leader. I am personally inspired by her courageous work to restore Burma's democracy. Ethan Zamung is a long-standing activist working to advance the rights of members of ethnic minority groups and promote and protect human rights in Burma. In 2015, she bravely endured detention and torture by the military for participating in a nationwide protest movement against a ban on student unions and teaching in ethnic minority languages. In the 2020 general election, she was one of the youngest candidates running for a seat in the lower house of parliament on a platform of promoting and protecting human rights and fighting discrimination. Following the military's brutal coup on February 1st, 2021, she has been a prominent voice for democracy and minority rights. She was among the first to lead anti-coup protests, inspiring countless peaceful pro-democracy supporters and encouraging participation in the civil disobedience movement. Currently, she serves as the Deputy Minister for Women, Youth, and Children's Affairs of the National Unity Government. Although forced into hiding for fear of arrest and torture and even death, 
she continues to speak out against the military takeover and to work tirelessly for a more inclusive, democratic future for the people of Burma. Thank you, Ethan Zamong, for your leadership and courage, and congratulations. And Ethan Zamong, welcome to this program today. Uh, let me add my congratulations on behalf of everyone who has tuned in. Uh, and uh, just ask you a couple of questions so we could get a sense of what is happening in Burma and what you and the National Unity Government are doing. This has been a very difficult time for your country since the military coup. And you and so many others are suffering greatly from what is happening. And especially those in the ethnic minority groups, women and youth with whom you work very closely. What do you want us to know? What should we know about what is happening in Burma? And tell us about the work of the National Unity Government and how you are working for peace. Um, hello, Ming Lava. I'm very glad to uh, meet you. Uh, I am Ethan Zamao. Um, I am the um, Deputy Minister of uh, Women, Youth and Children's Affairs ministry, ministry. I'm the youngest in the cabinet. I am the youngest and in our history, uh, I, I am the youngest uh, minister, I think. Uh, so uh, I have a lot of uh, problem, you know, um, because I'm very young. So a lot of people think, uh, can she do the job? Um, can, how, how can she get to this place? Uh, I have to uh, go through all these questions. Uh, I have to show that I have, I am um, worth to be in this place. So in the government where I'm working is also there are a lot of people who are more experienced and uh, older than me. So we have to really negotiate a lot. Uh, so um, a lot of people who I'm working with are at the age of my parents. So we have a gap in our generations. For example, when I talk, uh, I talk very uh, fast and very straightforward. But uh, from the other side, uh, for the elder people, they might think that I'm rude. So I have to face all these uh, situations. Uh, people are also, you know, uh, what the citizens are um, hoping from me, uh, it's on my shoulder. And in this uh, resistance, uh, it, whether we are winning or losing, it's also on my shoulder. So I, I, I think I'm, I have a lot of responsibility. So as all you know, the, um, the, the military uh, took over on the 1st uh, of February. Ever since, um, we cannot do and we cannot say anything anymore. Under this military dictatorship, no woman rights, no human rights. We cannot talk about this at all. And uh, uh, education wise, uh, we are very uh, late, uh, as you know. So we have to, uh, it's very difficult for us uh, about uh, women's rights and human rights. So when we talk about uh, women's rights, people say we have already human rights. Why should we talk about women's rights? Uh, do you want uh, extra uh, privilege? So that, that kind of accuse we, have, we are facing, uh, we, don't, we don't need women's rights. These ideas come from the West. Um, so that's, we, we don't need human, women's right in our country. We have our uh, culture, we have our law already. And uh, in that law, we already have women's right. So we don't need the idea from the West. Just before the, um, the coup, um, women's are, um, women active, activists had the, the chance to talk. But after the coup, um, the first target was uh, 
women activists, the, we are the first uh, target. Um, I am also, uh, I, I am really struggle to stay alive. And at the same time, um, we are um, trying to get uh, democracy and women's right. But as far as I understand, uh, we are women, we are activists, we are mother, we are sisters, and uh, we are also uh, creating peace. Uh, uh, wherever, uh, whether it is during the military committing genocide or it is the time we are under the civilian government, we should be uh, shouldn't be silent. We are we are responsible to speak up these uh, human rights abuses. So these are my inspiration. All these uh, activist movement uh, also inspire me. That's why I am in NUG government. Um, I that's why I stand in this government. I think that's what I am doing. Well, Ethan Zamang, even though you are young, as you say, uh, you and your sisters have been extraordinarily brave uh, in pushing back on, on the military as they have targeted um, not only the women, but particularly targeted women in very terrible ways. Uh, let me ask you, how can the international community best support the pro-democracy efforts that you and so many others are engaging in now? Uh, this is the time uh, in, in, in the situation in Burma. Um, today, we are at the turning point. As you know, um, we, we, ha we, uh, we have a civil war, um, civil war for uh, 70 years. But today, in the P among the people, this is a real unity and uh, we are um, demanding the democracy. It is a historic turning point. So the government uh, uh, has committed genocide. This military dictator we are fighting against is the single remaining tyrant since World War II. They uh, study in, in the, uh, outside the country and uh, we need a lot of help. They have been um, uh, governing the country for so long and uh, they are systematically organized. So to face this, we need a lot of help, especially this uh, security um, support we need. Number one, uh, we, uh, number two, we need a financially, uh, technically uh, support and for security. And uh, we need um, physically and mentally uh, support. Number three is uh, we need um, international to uh, um, please keep arm embargo on Burma from international. And uh, when they are, um, either we are under the uh, uh, military government or civilian government, uh, um, we have to, uh, we have to make sure this uh, perpetrator of uh, human rights to end the culture of impunity. This is the message I would like to convey to the international. Well, thank you so much. We've heard you loud and clear. And we will come back to you when we take the audience questions uh, and hear from you some more. We're now going to turn to Michael McCarthy, the United States ambassador to Liberia. He will introduce Fasia Boyano Harris, the co-founder of the Paramount Young Women's Initiative and the Liberian Feminist Forum. To the video, please. On behalf of the entire U.S. Embassy team here in Liberia, I am so excited to introduce you to Ms. Fasia Borieno-Harris. 
as one of the Secretary of State's 2022 International Women of Courage. Ms. Harris is the first Liberian to be honored with this important distinction. But she's part of a distinguished community of women leaders in Liberia who work every day to address the issues of women's rights and gender equality, helping to dismantle the obstacles that women unfortunately still face here. Ms. Harris, supported throughout her life by her mother, Nyama Harris, and her aunt, Wilametta D. Harris, represents a generation of women who had to come of age during the country's civil war and overcame immense challenges to gain an education. Her commitment to help protect girls from school-based sexual harassment and unplanned or early pregnancy is essential to stop a vicious cycle that limits women's participation in every professional sector by normalizing assault and curtailing women's education. The networks of activists and Liberian feminists she helped establish organized the country's first independent women-led protests against gender-based violence in 2018. And her bravery to stand up to counter protesters and aggressive security personnel were pivotal during a three-day anti-rape protest in August 2020 that directly led President George Weah declaring rape a national emergency and announcing other initiatives crucial to protecting Liberian women. We urge the government to follow through on their commitments with all due speed. We are so proud to be able to introduce Ms. Harris and to recognize her as an international woman of courage. Asiya, it is wonderful to have you with us. Uh, we add our congratulations and welcome to you as well. As we've just heard, you've been one of the leading uh, advocates for survivors of GBV, gender-based violence, uh, and you've served as a model local organizer, mobilizing so many women leaders and communities to address uh, sexual assault, harassment, FGM and other abuses. So tell us what inspired you to address the plight of women and girls, both during a Liberia's conflict and in this post-conflict uh, time. Uh, obviously from the video, we could see what great commitment you bring to your work. So tell us about that. Thank you very much and good afternoon from Morovia, Liberia. It's good to be uh, on this platform to share. So most part of my childhood and adolescent years were lived during the civil unrest in Liberia. So if you follow our country history, you know that we had a, a, a brutal civil war, which really, uh, which happened between 1989 and 2003. So most part of my growing up was spent you know, during that time. So you imagine what that would mean for a, a, a young woman like myself then being exposed to all kinds of violence, injustices, inequalities. And interestingly, with not even understanding at the time, you know, in context, what it really meant, but it did not resonate with my person, what was happening uh, you know, it, it could not rest within my spirit and who I was. I felt, always felt like something wasn't right. Um, so in my quest to understand uh, the unknown and to just be able to give back or help bring relief to people within, and especially women and girls within my immediate uh, environment was something that inspired me. And when I sit now and reflect on who was, you know, how I managed my thoughts through all those years, I, I would like to reflect on, you know, one encounter I had with my sixth grade teacher. I know um, in elementary school, before the crisis, we were used to having female teachers, so you have better relationship and conversations with them. So I remember on different occasions, always asking my teacher peace to her arches. Why is it that we have 
girls constantly not coming to school, my classmates, why are they not coming to school? Sometimes the, uh, the young, my classmates will come to school, you know, are uh, very not tired. Maybe they have um, slippers and we should be wearing shoes or even if they are wearing a pair of shoes, it's not very good. So we'll have conversation about that. And her voice always left in my ears when I ask, go ask him my random questions. She would just look at me and smile and say, Fasia, someday you will understand, you know, why these things are happening. And I guess there's some days that she spoke about is the noun and the current work that I do and what motivates me. So I was just reflecting when she said, someday you will understand. So when I sit back and I think I said, okay, she was trying to tell me that someday I will understand the injustice, the inequalities, the marginalization that, you know, we, we face with in our society. So in post-conflict Liberia, we still continue to see the struggles and, you know, the different efforts at the same time for the advancement of women's rights and for gender equality. So these are experiences that really help inspire the work that I do and, you know, for why I do it, because we continue to see these abuses happening to women and girls. We continue to see people being marginalized. We continue to see the abuse of power um, by people who are in different positions and spaces that are supposed to lead uh, change and be able to improve the livelihood of, of, of uh, uh, women and girls and, you know, ordinary citizens. So these are things that really drive uh, my passion and that inspire me to do what I do. The second part, uh, so the, I hope I got the first, the question completely and I will stop here. Well, uh, Fasia, just listening to you, you are in a long line, a grand example of the brave women of Liberia who actually were instrumental in ending your civil war there. Uh, and your work goes on. I, I wondered, do you face any particular threats or challenges? Um, and maybe you could tell us a little bit uh, in founding the organizations you did, how you work at the grassroots level. So um, the challenges face, yes, you, we do face or I do face challenges um, with the work that we do. We have challenges around resources, lack of logistics. We are challenged with the fact that we do not have, um, you know, timely on the media access to technological tools and systems that will allow us to function even better. The long-term uh, systematic bottlenecks and ineffectiveness of the system that doesn't work is also a challenge to our work. And if you know our context, like many other society, Liberia is a patriarchal power to, uh, society, you know, that is so, so male dominant. And that is a male, that dominance comes from the position where we have uh, male dominant leadership. So the power, the money, who has access to them? In most instances, they are men. So these are challenges to the work that we do. Uh, we've had threats, physical threats. We have verbal uh, threats to the work that we do. Online bullying, shaming, uh, laboring us as rural women, especially if you self-identify like myself as a feminist know that you are out there and you are going to be called out, you are going to be bullied on social media, in the communities when, you know, uh, calling you rude woman, you are a male hater, you are a group of better women who, you know, just want to cause problem. In some instances, you are labor opposition, you are opposition, you oppose, you know, the power that be and all of that. These are threats that we face daily. Uh, we continue to do the work that we do uh, because we believe in the change that we live to see, the change that we are benefiting from, from the women of Liberia, who our ancestors, warrior women who were before us, they, they, they did a lot of work, they built a foundation. Liberian women, like many other countries, did not have the opportunity to vote until very recently. So there were women who fought for those changes. So we are continuing to be inspired by their efforts, their sacrifices, 
and what keeps on going amidst these threats are these, you know, very strong, brave women who sacrifice their time and their lives and their resources to have us the space that we can be able to do the same advocacy and continue to impact change. So we continue to build system as a place of retreat and networks, safe spaces where we can be able, where we are able to provide support to each other uh, in times where we are threatened and we feel unsafe. So that's how that's how we do it. And yeah. Well, you're clearly a, a woman of great courage and commitment. Uh, we're going to come back to you during the Q&A session, so stay with us. Uh, but now we're going to turn to Douglas Conniff, uh, the U.S. Charge d'Affaires in Brazil, uh, to introduce Simone Sibilio. Can we turn to the video, please? I'm Douglas Conniff, Charge d'Affaires at the United States Embassy in Brasilia. It's an honor to present Simone Sibilio do Nascimento, whose distinguished career in public service has demonstrated, time and again, her personal courage and professional devotion to justice. As one of the most prominent women in Brazil's Attorney General's office, Simone has served as a prosecutor for 18 years with the state of Rio de Janeiro's public ministry. She plays a vital role in creating more secure communities by combating organized crime and public corruption, militias, and drug trafficking. When faced with opposition, this remarkable and dedicated prosecutor has never wavered. Simone has established herself as a policy leader amid challenging and sometimes dangerous conditions. She has held accountable dozens of perpetrators of extrajudicial killings, political violence, and economic exploitation of vulnerable populations. Her fellow citizens recognize in her an important leadership example, not only for Rio de Janeiro and Brazil, but for the world. She is the first woman ever to lead the Rio de Janeiro State Attorney General's specialized unit tasked with combating organized crime, one of the most prominent and sophisticated investigative units in Brazil. Simone has developed effective prosecution strategies on cases related to money laundering, arms trafficking, and transnational crime. In 2019, she received the Attorney General's highest commendation, the organization's Medal of Honor. This year, as Brazil celebrates its bicentennial and as we celebrate two centuries of diplomatic relations with our Brazilian partners, outstanding citizens like Simone Sibilio embody our two nations' shared democratic values, respect for rule of law, and the willingness to stand up for liberty and justice for all. We are proud to see her honored as an international woman of courage. Thank you. Well, Simone, congratulations to you and, and welcome uh, to this program uh, as well. Uh, as we've just heard, uh, you have been devoting your life to seeking justice for victims of crime, working for accountability and making communities safe. Brazil has one of the highest violent crime and homicide rates, and yet only a small uh, portion uh, of these ever get solved. First, I think our audience would like to know what makes you do this difficult work uh, because it is extremely uh, difficult and dangerous. Um, and maybe you could describe for us the gendered uh, impacts of these criminal networks and drug traffickers and what you're up against. Well, here in Brazil, it's good morning. And Ambassador, Madam Ambassador, it's a great pleasure to be here sharing my life. It's a story of fight for the women. I am a public servant, civil servant. I start working a uh, civil servant very young, 18 years of age. I was the first military police. And then I became chief of police and then to a public prosecutor. As a matter of fact, what has always inspired me is, is the fact to I wanted to question every day the reason why in Brazil we have so many homicide uh, cases and why in Brazil we do not have an accountability, a criminal prosecution of those that kill people. The history of organized crime in Brazil begins exactly 
inside the penitentiary systems. And even those that are uh, incarcerated, they continue to commit crime. So as a matter of fact, when I start working as a public prosecutor at the state of Rio de Janeiro, different from the reality in the United States, here we have a public um, test, if you will, we are not elected. But I notice that the victims were always forgiven. We have a serious problem to be benevolent with the criminals, maybe because of our legislation, sometimes due to other reasons. But the victims, whether they were killed or the family of the victims, they were not paid attention. So doing my fight right in the beginning when I started was to have a special vision, special eyes to those victims. But we have achieved a case of 65,000 homicides per year. That indicator has decreased recently. Sometimes homicides that occurred within the context of criminal organization. But we also have a, a high tax of feminicide. As a reason, 2019, we have 3,635 women killed, many of them young women, some black women. We also have a higher rate of victims of feminicide, which is insane, which is the husbands that kill their women because they cannot accept that divorce. The reason that the women cannot be free to have a relationship with someone else or to just be free by herself. That week, for example, last Friday, I reached out to a family uh, the husband killed a woman, stabbed the woman in front of four kids. So my work is to have this direct contact with the victims, try to have accountability to criminally prosecute those uh, perpetrators, because in this way, society will believe in just that family, particularly the woman was killed, the father is in jail, and the four children are orphans now. So what the public prosecutor should do, it is to embrace those victims, make sure that they believe in justice. And when we do that, we try to re-encounter ourselves with our mission every day. There is no greater satisfaction to see a perpetrator being criminally prosecuted and those victims being embraced. That family, as an example, they have the support of the older sister. So that fight for the victims, for the realization of justice is what has always inspired me. And a lot of times we face um, life threats when some of the victims are killed by the organized crime. And sometimes people, there are uh, members of the civil society. And that is exactly when the need, when the law, when justice must be uh, implemented, established, because we cannot admit that a human being kill another person, especially when that uh, human being is someone that works for the government. So to work and make justice realize, take place, it was really that brings me, makes me going on. The society expects us from us because as a matter of fact, we are paid by the citizens. Well, it sounds like uh, you're tr really trying to uh, make a difference uh, in this capacity in which you find yourself. I wonder what advice you might have, <coughs> excuse me, for other women uh, who are uh, in government, working through the legal system to advance justice uh, as you are. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about how civil society uh, is engaged in the work that you do. Lisa. I always think that the civil servant the judge, the public prosecutor, we are paid by, by the citizens, by the society, and we should never forget that. We receive the same salary, the same wage, working well or not. 
doesn't matter regardless but what really is going to impact the difference what we should what we ought to do we are agents to transform society the table and the pan is the same analogically speaking it's the same for all but to impact a different well what actually you will see the society will notice a difference at long term so it's very easy to close our eyes pretend we are not seeing shut up don't say anything and don't do anything and it seems that us civil servants we should say something when it's more convenient to not say anything and close our eyes when it's easier and then to act when it would much easier to not do anything the wage the salary received is the same but it was actually it's going to impact society it is to create this inconvenience within the organized crime because at the end of the day the the when we act positively will benefit the society which is expecting the public prosecutor and the judge that are acting accordingly to their functions that's what they expect well that's what they expect and you're obviously doing an extraordinary job uh, so we're now we're going to turn to our audience so they can join this conversation uh, and ask you the questions that are on their minds and i'm going to turn to my colleague ali smith uh, to give us uh, those questions please thanks milan this first question asks um, strong discriminatory attitudes and biases continue to limit progress for women and girls around the world. What have you seen work to shift and overcome these attitudes in your work? And how do you bring your communities, particularly men, on board to champion sensitive issues like FGM and sexual harassment? So we know that norms and attitudes and biases are at the root of so many of these problems that all three of you are working to confront. Uh, what advice do you have uh, to answer that in answering that question? Who wants to go first? Have you brought men into your work to help uh, change the circumstances uh, that are creating impediments? Yes, I can, I can go first. Um, am I, can I? Yes, please. Go ahead, Fasia. So um, the work that we do, we do um, bring in men, our primary uh, audience or, you know, people we work with are women. But we have programs that incorporate men for change of behavior. When we do general community outreach activities, when we take to the radio stations to do a witness, we do transformative, uh, transformative leadership trainings at a community level. So we do engagement. In fact, quite recently, we have also tried to intensify the work we do at the community level with men because we realized that um, women, initially we were working with women to understand their rights, to be able to take action uh, and report violence against them. But violence continues to happen. So when we do work, we go to the communities, we put men in groups. Uh, personally, our institution work in four different communities at the moment with four male groups on harmful masculinity and gender norms to bring them into the conversation and to help them serve as change agents. But we are very careful as to how we do that because most often if you do not train carefully, you bring men and women in the same spaces to talk about issues of women's rights and sexual gender-based violence, you will re-victimize women and you, you, you bring you know, them up with men. And before you realize the men in the spaces try to uh, uh, um, blame women for, you know, for the action, like here in Liberia, when you talk about rape, one of the first questions that will come from men and sometimes women will be, why did she wear a short clothes? Or why was she in this venue or this particular locale at a particular time. 
wave come on. So uh, you, we have we are very careful as to how we integrate men into the work that we do, but we do realize that it's critical and we 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 will meet them where they are at different times, but there are general messages that we gave out on prevention and all of that that incorporate men. But in our context, you have to be able first to even understand, make women to understand that this action that was, uh, or this harm that was done against you is a crime, is punishable. There are laws on the book to punish the, pep the alleged perpetrators, to make women aware of their rights. For beating on women is another thing. In some culture, it's acceptable that a man can beat on the woman and she is not allowed to talk about it. She is supposed to keep the it as a family secret. So how do you bring men and women in that instance to talk about keeping what of, of violence our perpetrator perpetrated against her by her male relative or spouse or someone very close to her when it's supposed to be kept as a secret and not to report it to denigrate, you know, or spoil the family name as we say it. But we do recognize that it happens that, it, that there's a need to incorporate men. How and when is what we train on very, very carefully. Well said. And, Thank you. Just, just, just sorry. Go ahead. The, in universities, you, we talk about how we established the Parma Young Women Initiative. This was established at the university level. And when we started working at the university level in 2005, just to raise funds to be able to help keep uh, female students in school, we did other programs. We would do lecture series, we'll have dialogue on campus that incorporated the female students, the male students as well. So I just wanted to highlight that part. Thank you for the question. Well, that was a good comprehensive answer. Does anybody else want to tackle that question? Otherwise we'll move on. Okay, uh, Allie. Sure, the next question is what advice would you give to young women in countries where speaking up for women's rights puts them at great danger? How can women leaders around the world best support each other? Ethan Zamong, do you want to try that? Okay, if you want to share. Yes, I'm going to answer that question. Uh, we are uh, we are under the uh, military coup. Uh, we are facing that. Uh, at this time, we are shouting democracy. And uh, all we women uh, are requesting about uh, women's right and also constitutional. Um, uh, we want the, the role of women to, to put in the uh, constitution. And during the uh, consistent uh, resistance, uh, justice for women and children who were victim during this uh, resistance. We have a lot of uh, uh, struggle, of course. Some people are saying that, um, isn't this enough, uh, only democracy? Do you need to talk about other things? So that's what we are hearing. Um, so sometimes this uh, discrimination, people are used to this discrimination. This is what happened in our environment. Um, if you are, if you are experience this uh, discrimination all the time, all of your life, you don't think this is uh, something new. So we have to uh, speak out uh, that this is a discrimination against women. And uh, of course, uh, we have not only with um, uh male but uh but uh, other generation uh, even my mother or like you know the people in the elder generation uh, we, we have uh, the, they are against uh, uh, our voice so we have to participate in many level um in today um political ideology this is uh, how we are um, fighting now so we have to tell the public that this is this is political idea. We uh, we have to um, keep women's right issue um, 
during this resistance. Uh, because some, you know, our people are forgetting about rights because they, they just want to fight the military government. So uh, all our politicians and activists, um, we have to lead the public um, for the policy. We, because we are the one who are, you know, uh, laying down these policy, we have to lead. So if we don't, uh, don't talk about this rights issue right now, uh, in the future, we are going to face another fight. So during we are um, fighting for democracy, we have to talk about the rights uh, at the same time. So you have to, it is not normal, this discrimination. We can normalize this discrimination in our daily life. So women's rights, human rights, uh, we have to value these uh, rights today. We, we talk about this every day. We have to follow this. Uh, I always talk to the public uh, like that because this is what I believe in. We have to walk like that. This is what I'm doing. So this is my, um, yeah, uh, yeah, of course, uh, people criticize me or blame me. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I have to do whatever I believe. I, ca I can't drop that whatever I believe. This is my value. So thank you very much. Well, your uh, commitment shines through and I'm sure that's an inspiration uh, to other women uh, seeing you in action. Uh, can we go to the next question, please? Sure, this question's for Simone. As the first woman prosecutor leading a specialized unit to combat organized crime, did you feel that your gender impacted how you conducted your work? What challenges did you face as a trailblazing woman in that role and how did you overcome them? Obrigada pela pergunta e é um prazer responder Thank you for the question. It's a pleasure for me to answer this. In Rio de Janeiro, historically speaking, all the coordinators of this group were men forever, decades. I was the first woman to coordinate this group that was the specialized unit to combat organized crime. And during the time that I worked there, there was a, a crime that was very well known internationally, the crime against Marielle. Marielle was a um, representative. She was the, a woman, a black woman defending minorities, uh, defending LGBTQ plus. She was killed by a murder for a shot in a very busy street in Rio. At that time, I was the coordinator of the group. So the responsibility of being a woman and having to resolve crimes like this was a weight on me, but at the same time was a very big stimulus for me. What we noticed is that a woman in Brazil, and I imagine all over the world, the woman has a strength and that strength is incomparable. There is a commitment too that is incomparable. The woman can do everything at the same time. And we know that exactly because of this uh, difference, historical difference, we do extra. We always have to do extra to show what everybody already knows that we're capable of doing. And we have to do that very well. So that experience was a wonderful experience. And what's most interesting is that society realized that, they recognized that, they noticed that there was a woman there in leadership, taking care of everything. And as so many women do their work, and we have that history of like double journey, working twice as much responsibility. And we know that unfortunately, not all men are able to do that. So that experience was wonderful to shine light on an issue that we are what we want to be and we are capable of doing everything that we need to do. The result of our action in this group, historically speaking, always 
working like with men, it was a wonderful um, result. Even media in the press, we were able to uh, dismantle a big, one of the biggest criminal organizations. This was, this happened when we were doing all the investigations. It was directly to us. So it was a, amazing to be part of this group. And there was a, a adjunct a coordinator of, and she was a woman too. There's so many men, they're so competent, but it was important for, us that a woman was in charge of that. So that experience was a wonderful and a very, uh, uh, an experience that made me grow a lot. Well, that that's an excellent, uh, excellent uh, answer, Simone. And I know that by virtue of your taking on this hard work and this position, you inspire so many other women uh, to also uh, try to do what they can in this kind of very difficult work uh, taking on organized crime. Uh, we don't have any time left, unfortunately. I know that we could go on uh, in this conversation with all of you, uh, but let me just end with some thank yous uh, to the State Department and to Kat Bodovet and all of the staff in the Office of Global Women's Issues uh, and to our embassies that are involved uh, in, in the selections. Uh, for this award that the three of you have received. Um, I also want to make sure that uh, we acknowledge and congratulate again, you, Ethan Zanmung, for the work you're doing with the National Unity Government in Burma in standing up to the repression uh, that the military uh, is, is conducting every day uh, and what you and others have to confront um, and, and despite your young years, uh, the commitment that you uh, demonstrate in doing that. Uh, to you, Fasia, for carrying on that great tradition in the women of Liberia uh, over all of the years uh, in, in working so hard uh, to bring about change and for tackling very tough issues like gender-based violence. Uh, you too inspire us. And to you, Simone, uh, for your very, very uh, considerable efforts uh, in government to do perhaps uh, one of the hardest things to do, uh, to deal with um, organized crime, to deal with all of the threats uh, to society, uh, not just to what you and others like you encounter. So the three of you are indeed extraordinary examples of courage, um, and examples and inspiration to us, because in one place or another, uh, these issues that you're working on are issues that everyone is working on uh, in one degree or another. Uh, so getting your advice, uh, getting your inspiration, uh, getting your example uh, is something that we are all grateful for. So thank you for what you do. Uh, thank you for what you will continue to do. And once again, our congratulations to each of you. Take care. Bye-bye.